The book of Psalms tonight, Psalm 119, if you will. The book of Psalms, Psalm 119 and verse number 63, the Bible says, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Let's pray. Father, tonight we do thank you for the testimony that we heard. We're glad you're still in the soul-saving business. Lord, we just pray you'd continue to work in hearts and lives. And Lord, there are others that we rejoice in. We, we think of Tony that came to know Christ this week and, and Andrew and his wife Lisa. And Lord, what a, what a blessing this week has been as you've just continued to shower blessings upon us and upon others. And we pray you'd just make us uh, concerned about those that are around us without the Savior. Cause us to be a, a soul-seeking church, one that's concerned about those without the Savior. We pray tonight that, Lord, as we talk about this subject of uh, walking with those that are companions of yours, Lord, we ask you that you would teach us tonight in this matter of what kind of church a church ought to be. Bless us this evening. Lift up Jesus. And, Lord, help us walk in a Christ-honoring fashion as a church, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The Bible says in verse 63 of Psalm 119, I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. When it comes to the business of finding the right church for your family, finding a church to belong to, one of the questions we must ask is, first and foremost, what kind of church would Jesus look for? And I think that there are some answers in our Bible. The title of the message tonight is very simply this, Why Be a Baptist? Why in the world, especially in our world today, when folks are just changing their names and trading out what they believe, and some Baptist churches are dropping the name and going to Bible church and community church and all kinds of other names, why in the world do we use the name Baptist? What in the world is this this Baptist business about anyway? And as you've heard preached many, many times from this pulpit, being a Baptist will never get you to heaven. Well, if being a Baptist isn't going to get you to heaven, then what difference does it make? Well, friend, it makes a lot of difference. If you're in the wrong kind of a church, you won't be pointed in the right direction. Get in the wrong kind of a church, the message won't be as clear as it needs to be. In the wrong kind of a church, surely you will not get the doctrine and the teaching that you ought to have whereby you and your family can grow aright. And that's what the psalmist was saying here in verse 63. He said, I'm a companion of all them that fear thee, and he says, of them that keep thy precepts. I want to walk with people that love God and live for God. I want to walk with people that know the Lord and care about the things of the Lord. I want to walk with people that just want to be honest and do what God's Word teaches. And so, when I I got saved, I remember as I got saved coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, I remember that night when I got saved, one of the things that concerned me was, what church will I now go to? And I prayed and I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, you're going to have to show me. I need to know what church to belong to. I need to know where to be. And, Lord, I want to know it from the Bible. That was my concern. I wanted to know from the Bible what kind of church a Christian ought to be a member of. And I figured if I couldn't find it in the Bible, then it'd have to be the wrong kind of a church. And so that's just kind of how I approached the whole subject when I first got saved back in 1971. And I found in the Bible, I believe, what a church ought to be. Back in the passage where we looked at this morning, if you just slip your way over there again, in Matthew chapter number 16, Jesus had asked the question, Who do men say I am? The disciples had said, Well, they've got various answers. And then Jesus said, Well, who do you say I am? Which is the important question. And Peter volunteered the information. And he said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus then said, as he got excited, he said, Peter, this is great. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. You didn't figure this out on your own. You didn't get it from some teacher somewhere. My Father, which is in heaven, has shown you this. That's the only way you could recognize such a thing, that I'm the anointed one, the Christ, that I'm the one that's the chosen one, Christ. I'm the one chosen by the Father to take away the sin of the world, but I'm also the Son of the living God. That Son of God title then speaks of deity, of the fact that Jesus was not just a man, but He was God Himself. 
And then Jesus said these words in verse number 18. He said, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And as we spoke about this morning, and we took the Scriptures and we walked through them, we saw that this rock that Jesus was speaking about was not Peter. This rock was not a man, not a fallible man that could make mistakes and sin and walk away from the Lord, but rather this rock was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the purpose that Christ had in coming into this world, and then the power of Christ in being able to save and secure those that, that come to Him. And so that's the picture of the rock. But notice what Jesus says. He says, you're Peter, and upon this rock, this confession that you've just made of who I really am, upon this rock I will build, and here's the two words, my church. And we ask the question, well, what in the world was Jesus building? And let's ask the question tonight, because I think this is important in trying to find the right church to be a member of. What kind of church did Jesus build? And if I can figure that out, then I can figure out what kind of church I ought to be a member of. When it comes to this word church, we, we first of all look at the scriptural direction. We're trying to determine what kind of church is right. So we begin by saying, what's the scriptural direction? Well, this word church is an interesting word. It's a word which means a called out assembly. Called out from places, from wherever they work and live and, and their lives are engaged throughout daily living. Called out to assemble, it's a called out assembly, to assemble at a particular place. Now, an assembly is something that has location. An assembly is something that has visibility. You can see it when people assemble. An assembly is something that gets together. And but Jesus said this, he said, I'm come to build my church. And so Jesus' church is more than just an assembly. Jesus' church is an assembly for the purpose of carrying out what Christ has said a church ought to do. Now, when I say that, what I mean by that is it's, here's, here's a simple definition from the Bible for the word church, for the Lord's church. The Lord's church is made up of saved people, people that have been born again. The only kind of people that ought to be a member of a church are people that have a, a conversion experience and a testimony that they can give to others. Our church, we, we put a lot of stock in that. We ask folks to give their testimony before they join. Some people will not join our church because they don't want to have to stand in front of others and tell them what God has done in their life. And maybe sometimes it's because of fright as they look out and they say, Boy, I wouldn't want everybody looking at me. And I can understand that. But friend, if Christ really lives in your heart, you'll not be ashamed to own Christ and to tell others of Christ, especially a friendly crowd. Like, I mean, maybe not a good-looking crowd all the time, but a friendly crowd who's, who's sympathetic and, and loves the Lord too. I mean, if you won't tell people who are saved that you're saved, then you'll certainly never tell anybody outside the church house, who, you know, lost folk, you're going to keep your mouth closed. And that's not what a disciple ought to do. But other folks may say, well, I don't want to give my testimony because I just frankly don't have one. And in that case, I would suggest to you the very best thing for you to do is to sit down and examine your own salvation, friend. You ought to have a testimony that, that makes sense not only to you, but makes sense first and foremost to God, and second, makes sense to God's people. And if it doesn't make sense to God's people, there's something wrong there. So a church is made up of saved people, born-again people. Second, people that have been scripturally baptized. The way into the Lord's church is through scriptural baptism. We'll say more about that a little later probably, but, but baptized folk are the only ones that belong in the church, and that is the door into that church. Third of all, it's saved, baptized people that gather together. That's what a church is. It's an assembly. And so if you don't assemble here from time to time, if you don't join us in our regularly scheduled meetings, then what you're saying is, I'm not part of the assembly anymore. That's why we have in our, in our Constitution that after three months, if a person has not been regular and faithful in attendance and they have no real reason for not being here after that three months, they then become a candidate to be dropped from the membership. And we don't just hatch at them right away normally. But uh, if there's no real interest and we can't get any real response or commitment to get faithful to God again, then we'll drop their membership. Because being a member means that you're going to assemble with the assembly. Saved, baptized, gather together. Why do we gather together? For the purpose of the Great Commission. We have a reason for being here. We don't just build buildings. We aren't just interested in gathering up money so we can fill the, the pockets of the preacher and the staff. 
We're here for a purpose. Our purpose is to carry out the Great Commission, to get the gospel around the world, to let the whole world know that Jesus Christ has died for their sin and He offers to them eternal life. That becomes the, the very heartbeat of the Lord's church. And that's what the Lehigh Valley Baptist Church is all about. Now, some folks, when you begin to talk about a church, they get the wrong idea. They think, well, a church, isn't that a building? Well, friend, if you're looking for a building to join, you've got the wrong idea because Jesus never had a building. It was not a building that Jesus said that he would build. Other folks say, well, I, uh, I want to join a denomination. Well, friend, you've got the wrong idea because Jesus never started a denomination as such. He did not start a, an organization that then becomes the power and the overseeing authority over all the different local churches. He never started that. Jesus did not start a denomination. So if you're looking for a denomination, Jesus didn't say, I'll build my denomination. He said, I'll build my church. The, the third thing, some folks say, well, I, I believe in the church, but I believe in the, in the Catholic church. And you say, well, I don't necessarily mean the, the Roman Catholic, but I believe in the Catholic. That word Catholic means universal. Well, now, universal church, as the Catholics would define it, would be like this. They believe in a universal. Universal means all around the world, everywhere. Visible church. By visible, what they mean are the people who congregate around the world under their dome of, of Roman Catholicism and answer to, of course, their priest, ultimately the bishop, and then the cardinal, and then on up the, the pole, the totem pole, until you get to the pope himself. And he oversees this one world church, this, this universal, visible church. That's the Catholic's view of what a church is. But friend, that was never the view of Jesus Christ. It was never a term used in Jesus' day. It was never construed that way by anybody in any Greek literature in any time at all during the time of Christ. It, it was not the way people thought of what a church was. Along came Martin Luther, though. In the 1500s, early 1500s, Martin Luther uh, professes to have gotten saved. And whether he is or isn't is is a matter for some debate, I suppose. As I read some of his writings, I rather doubt that the man knew Christ as, a, as his personal Savior. But that's neither here nor there. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest. When he decided that he had to break with Rome over his, his different reasons that he was upset with Rome over, he realized that as the Catholic Church teaches, that being a member of Rome, joining Rome's church, is the equivalent of having your key to get into heaven. If you're not a member of Rome, if you're not a member of Rome's church, if you're not under Rome's authority, then you do not have any guarantee or any real hope of getting to heaven. Now, will you contrast that for just a moment here? Will you contrast that with what Baptists believe and teach? Baptists do not believe and Baptists do not teach that you go to heaven because you're a Baptist. It's not being a Baptist that saves you. Catholicism says being a Catholic does play the part of getting you into heaven. That's their writings, not mine, and can be proven from their own writings. But Martin Luther, as a Roman Catholic priest, realized, now, if I'm going to disagree with the Roman Catholic Church, and I leave this Roman Catholic Church, I am leaving God. I am leaving heaven. I am leaving my only hope of heaven, and I've got serious problems. So Martin Luther sat down, and he formulated what today is known as the Universal Invisible Church. He believed in this Catholic Church, Universal Church, but he said it's an invisible church. It's not those that assemble under Rome's auspices, but it's all these people around the world who are, who are Christians, but they don't necessarily assemble. They don't necessarily get together. They're just people around the world, and we don't know who they are, but God knows who they are. Well, it sounds pretty good, and it's now been taught around the world, and, and there are many people today, and, and most all Protestant churches, believe in what's called a universal invisible church. The problem is, that a universal, invisible church, both those two terms, are completely contrary to what the word ecclesia or church means. Church means called out assembly. When you're called out from the world and assemble in a particular location, you have locality and visibility. You are somewhere, you're not everywhere, universal. You are somewhere, locality, and you are visible. You're not invisible, you're visible. And isn't it wonderful that we are visible people? I mean, you can see who the folks are that are sitting next to you. And thank the Lord, when you walk out of here, if you keep your eyes open, you don't have to bump into anybody that you couldn't see. They're there to be seen. Amen. 
what, what kind of a church service would it be anyway? There are churches where they have these kind of church services where you look out and all you see is a bunch of empty pews and you say, my soul, the invisible church has shown up this morning. And uh, not my kind of a church, not the kind I want to be a part of, amen. I want a visible church. So there's this invisible idea. But in the Bible, now watch, in the Bible, 114 times the word church is used. Of the 114 times, 100 times the word church is used to speak of a particular congregation. Like the church at Ephesus or the church at Colossae or the church at Philippi. It's a particular congregation. Or, if you will today, like the Lehigh Valley Baptist Church in Emmaus. It's a particular congregation. That's the way the word is used in the Bible. You say, well, what about the other 114 times? Well, let me show you. Turn in the Bible, if you will, real quickly to the book of Ephesians. Look, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. What would you just do? Wait a minute. Turned in the Bible. Who said that? What Bible? Well, wait a minute. I said the Bible. This is the Bible. Which Bible do you have? Yours. Now, isn't it interesting how he translated that idea of turn in the Bible to turn in my Bible? And that's exactly what you did. When the Bible speaks about the church, it's using it in a, in a generic way, an abstract way. When I said turn in the Bible, that's a term that's generic. It's a term that is abstract. I didn't mean everybody quick rush up here around the pulpit and let's turn in the Bible. This is the Bible. No, I meant turn in your Bible. I'll turn in my Bible. We'll all turn in our individual Bibles and we'll look for ourselves at the Bible. And when Jesus used in the, in the Scriptures, the Apostle Paul used this term, uh, church, he used it sometimes in that very way to speak about, in a generic sense, not any particular church, but it applies to every particular church. Then there are a couple times when he used the word church, like in Hebrews chapter 12, to talk about the glorified church which is yet to come that does not exist today, that bride of Christ will, which will yet be in the future. So when we talk about this word church, Jesus says, I will build my church. What is he trying to build? He's not building a building. He's not building a denomination, friend. He's not building a, a visible, universal church. He's not building a universal, invisible church. He is building a visible, local church, one that can be seen and one that can be attended. One that you and I can attend, be part of its services, be part of its ministry, and be part of the outreach around the world. That's the church that Jesus was building. And so it's a local church. Now, when we say that, we then ask ourselves, and we need to ask this because we're looking for scriptural direction. If, if a church is local and it's got visibility and it's got purpose, then we must ask ourselves this question because we're still trying to identify what church it is that Jesus started. If we can figure out what church Jesus started, we'll have an idea what kind of church we ought to be involved with. When did the church start? Some folks say, well, the church didn't start until late in the book of Acts. Others say, well, it started on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And I say, absolutely not. The church started during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus. And somebody may scratch your head and say, well, how can you be so sure? Oh, it's real simple. What does the word church mean? It means a called out assembly. And when Jesus uses the term, it talks about saved people that have been scripturally baptized for the purpose of gathering together, for the purpose of carrying out the Great Commission. Those four things are important in the Lord's church. And so we say, well, when did this church begin? If it didn't start on the day of Pentecost, when did it begin? Well, we know as far back as Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gave instructions. And he said, what I want done in the church is, when you have a problem with a brother, you go to that brother and try to deal with it. And if that doesn't work out, then you sit down with, with some witnesses and try to work it out. And if that doesn't work out, then if necessary, you bring it to the congregation and deal with it in the church, he said. Now, his disciples were standing there that day. He was giving them instructions, and he said, if you've got a problem with a brother and you can't work it out, you take witnesses, and if that doesn't work out, then you take it to the church. Right then and there, if there was no church, if there wasn't a church in existence, would not the disciples have slipped up their hand or Peter just blurted it out and said, Lord, what is a church? Now, doesn't that make sense? 
I mean, there had to have been a church when Jesus told them to go to the church. And if there wasn't a church and Jesus had said, go to the church, doesn't it make sense that they would have said, Lord, what are you talking about? What church? What assembly? Where do we look for this thing? But they knew exactly what he was talking about. Over in the book of Hebrews, uh, if we were to slip over there, we'll not take the time, but in Hebrews chapter 12, or 2, uh, verse number 12, we're told over there that Jesus sang in the church. Well, when did Jesus ever sing in the New Testament? There's only one time. And that was over in the book of Matthew chapter 26, at the end of the Lord's Supper, after he'd instituted the Lord's Supper, and they got ready to go out into the garden. And what'd they do? The Bible says they sang a hymn. Oh, now, they sang a hymn means Jesus sang with them. Boy, what a voice that must have been, and what a song it must have been. I don't know what they sang, but they sang, my friend. Jesus sang in the church, Hebrews tells us. And so, my friend, it must have been a church by that time. And we could go on and on. We could, we could look, for instance, at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41 and verse number 47, where it says that when they received the Word of God, they were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. But in verse 47, what's it say? It says they were added where? To the church. Now, friend, you can't add something to something that doesn't exist. Something had to exist first. That church existed in order for them to be added to it. And so, these people were added to a church that already existed. It was already in existence by the time of the Lord Jesus. But you say, well, I don't understand what difference this makes. Oh, it makes a lot of difference. Turn, if you will, to the book of... uh, Let me think here. Let's go to... uh, Let's go to Luke chapter 6. Let's just do that. The book of Luke, chapter number 6, verse 12. It says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, of whom uh, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Now watch. He called his disciples together. He chose 12 of them, and he named them apostles. Now keep that thought in your mind, and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 12. Verse number 28. The Bible says, in verse 28, it says, And God has set some in the church. First who? Apostles. Well, now, when did he call them apostles? Luke, chapter 6. Follow this thought. Luke chapter 6, he called them apostles. The Bible says he first set the apostles in the church. The apostles were set in the church in Luke chapter 6. Now, you don't set somebody into something that doesn't exist. Again, like you don't add something to something that doesn't exist. These men were ordained as apostles, but watch, they were members before Jesus set them apart as the apostles within the church, before they were given the office of an apostle. So you say, well, when did that church actually begin? The earliest stage we could go back to would be when Jesus went to them and he called them out. The Bible says he called them out. He went to them individually, one at a time, and he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, were those men already saved? Yes, Had they already been baptized? And the answer is yes. For the book of Acts chapter 1 tells us that the apostles all had John's baptism. It was a prerequisite. And the Bible says in Luke that John's job was to prepare a people for the Lord's church. That's what John was doing. And so here's John preparing a people for the Lord. Jesus goes and picks out of John's disciples, the twelve, calls them to come to follow him. There's that called out assembly. Come, follow me. And what purpose? I will make you fishers of men. And so they had their purpose. They had locality. They had a purpose. But watch, they were already saved people. They had a testimony. And they had scriptural baptism because they had John's baptism. The fellow called the other day and he said, I don't believe that John's baptism was scriptural. Well, friend, you may not believe it, but Jesus was happy with it. And it's the only baptism Jesus ever had. In fact, he walked some 60 miles to get that baptism. So Jesus must have been happy with it. John's baptism is New Testament baptism. In fact, Jesus said there's only two kinds of baptism. In the book of Matthew 21, 25, he said there's only two kinds of baptisms. There's, there's baptism from heaven and there's baptism of men. Which is John's 
And that's what Jesus was asking the question of. The disciples would, or the uh, Pharisees wouldn't answer him. And the obvious answer was, John's baptism came from heaven. He had the very authority of God himself as he did his baptizing. And so when we, when we look for a church, what we're saying is this. We're looking for a church that assembles. We're looking for a church that, that realizes that they have a purpose and is going to fulfill that purpose. And a church that believes that people have to be saved and scripturally baptized. That narrows our parameters down as we look for a church. That is our scriptural direction. But second, there is a historical demonstration of the Lord's church. Now, follow this. The Bible says, in fact, let's turn there. Matthew chapter 28. You remember the passage we read in Matthew 16? It said over there, I will build a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus did the building. Jesus started the church. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Watch this promise. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's the purpose. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And watch, lo, I am with you. How long? All the way. Even unto the end of the what? The world. Follow. What Jesus said is, I started the church, but I want you to know right now, this is a church commission, I want you to know right now that I am going to be with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. In other words, from the time I start my church on until the end of the world, the end of the age, until that rapture takes place, there will be Bible preaching, Bible practicing churches that have their authority from me. Now, lest you think I'm exaggerating, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 3 for a moment. Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 21. The Bible says, Unto him be glory in the what? Church. There it is, that local assembly. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout how many ages? All ages, world without end. Amen. In other words, Paul is saying from, from now on, May it be so that in every age that Christ will get glory throughout all the ages. There will always be churches that will be preaching, practicing, and, and telling the truth around the world. That is the promise of Almighty God. That from the time that Jesus started a church until the time that Jesus calls Christians out of here, there will always be churches every age, every century, every year, all the time that we'll be preaching and practicing the Word of God. Now, if we, could, if we could draw a lesson from this for a moment. Any church that started after the time of Jesus Christ cannot be the Lord's church. You say, what? Yeah, if Jesus started the first church and a new organization is birthed that is not the Lord's church, and it's birthed after the time of Christ, then it can't be the Lord's church. If their founding started sometime after Christ, it's not the Lord's. Now, follow this. The Fourth Square Church started out of the Azusa Street Mission in 1923. Amy Simple McPherson is their founder. The Assemblies of God started in 1914, also out of that Azusa Street Mission in California. The Nazarenes in 1885, F.S. Breeze was their founder. The Jehovah Witnesses, founded by Charles Taz Russell in 1884. The Christian Scientists in 1861 by Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy. <clears throat> wow. It's a mouthful. The Seventh-day Adventists in 1843, founded by a woman by the name of Ellen White, off the back of the teachings of a man by the name of William Miller. The Mormons in 1830 by Joseph Smith. The Christian Church and the Church of Christ uh, split but they came out of the founding movement by Alexander Campbell in 1827. The Methodists in 1729 by John Wesley. The, the Quakers in 1729 by George Fox. The Congregationalists in 1602 split off the Episcopal Church. In uh, 1540, the Episcopal Church was founded. It split off the Roman Catholic Church, and it was founded by King Henry VIII because he wanted to have another wife, and the Pope wouldn't let him. 
the Presbyterian Church in 1535, founded by John Calvin, the Lutheran Church in 1517 by Martin Luther, the Greek Orthodox came out of the Catholic Church in 1050, and the Roman Catholic Church was founded in 590 A.D. by Pope Gregory VIII. Now, friend, what I've just said is those churches were not founded by Christ. They were founded sometime after the time of Christ. It precludes, it ends the possibility that they are the Lord's church that Jesus started. Well, Baptists, aren't they Protestant? No, sir, we are not Protestants. Protestants come out of Rome. Protestants break off of Rome. They either come directly out of Rome or they break off of some other group that broke off of Rome. Listen to what historians have said. Zwingli, one of the three major leaders of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin, Martin Luther, and Zwingli, those three men, Zwingli, he said this, the institution of the Anabaptists is no novelty. They're nothing new. But for 1,300 years, they have caused great trouble to the church. Mosheim, here's a Lutheran historian. He said, before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there was secreted in almost all the countries of Europe persons who adhered tenaciously to the principles of the modern Dutch Baptists. Robert Barclay, a Quaker, a Quaker historian, said this, there are also reasons for believing in the continent of Europe that there were small, hidden Christian societies who held the name of Baptist and that they had existed from the time of the apostles. John Wittenbach, a Methodist historian. And we're, not, we're not quoting Baptists now. We're quoting other crowds. Here's a Methodist historian, John Wittenbach. I should not readily admit that there was a Baptist church as far back as A.D. 100, though without doubt, he says, there were Baptists then, as all Christians were Baptists. Hmm. Interesting admission. Alexander Campbell, the founder of the Church of Christ, said, From the apostolic age to this present time, the sentiments of Baptists have had a continued chain of advocates and public monuments of their existence in every century, and that can be produced. Then, Sir Isaac Newton, an English philosopher, said this, The modern Baptists, formerly called the Anabaptists, are the only people who have never symbolized with the papacy. In other words, never been part of Rome, they weren't breaking off of Rome. They were around all the while. We could go on and on. We could go back through history and find that by different names our forefathers were known, not necessarily by the name Baptist, but, but they believed Baptist doctrine and teaching. They believed as we do. Often their names that were given to them were derogatory names, like the name Anabaptist. The name Anabaptist is not the name of a woman tied to Baptist. Anna means re-baptizers. Now, where do we get that name? Anabaptists, re-baptizers. Well, it's real simple. You see, when, when folks came and wanted to join a Baptist church, our forefathers said, you're coming out of Rome? Sorry, we don't recognize their baptism as being biblical or Christian, and we require you to be baptized. The, our enemies then looked at that, and they said, my soul, that's a terrible thing for you to do. You're re-baptizing them. The Baptist said, what do you mean re That's not re-baptism. That's baptism. Your baptism isn't baptism. So this is the real thing. It's not again baptism. This is the first one they've ever got. But our, but our enemies came and said, oh, no, you're Anabaptists. You're re-baptizers. Then we could go on with other names, the Montanists and the Waldensians, the, the Lollards and the Huguenots and, and the Albigenses and on and on, different names that they were given. And those names often, again, were, were derogatory names that were given to them. So what we've seen tonight is that there's a scriptural direction in the Word of God as to what kind of a church to look for. Second, there's, there's a historical demonstration that there have, has been another kind of church around besides just the Roman Catholics. And there are only two kind out. Now watch, only two kinds of churches today that claim to have a history that goes back to the time of Jesus. None of the other groups do because all the other groups know they're Protestants. They broke off of Rome. The two groups are these. The Roman Catholic Church, which claims to have been started by Jesus through Peter, who was the first pope. And the Baptists, who claim that their church was started by Jesus during His earthly ministry. That's the only two choices, friend. The only two groups alive, the only two groups that go back to the time of Christ. It's one or the other. And if that rock in Matthew chapter 16 that we spoke of this morning is Peter, then the Roman Catholic Church is the church you need to go to. If that rock, my friend, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Roman Catholic Church most assuredly is not the church of Jesus Christ, and it is an Antichrist church, if you will. 
They stand against Christ by their doctrine. You say, well, are you saying that all Catholics are terrible people? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This has to do with what the church teaches officially. There are people who sit in Baptist churches don't believe what's taught from the pulpit, as there are people in Catholic churches who don't believe what's taught from Rome. And so just because somebody attends somewhere doesn't mean that they necessarily agree with everything that's taught. But that is what the church teaches, the Roman Catholic Church teaches. They teach a false gospel. So as Baptists, third of all, we need to ask ourselves for a doctrinal distinction. And this is one of the things that will help you and I identify what a true New Testament church is. We're not just looking for historical proof and the, and the scriptural proof of what kind of a church, but now we want to look at the, the doctrinal distinction. There are some things that will be believed by a true church. Here it is, B-A-P-T-I-S-T. B. B stands for a Bible. Christians believe, God's people believe that Jesus Christ gave us a Bible. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is the inspired Word of God. We also believe, Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, that God has preserved His Word. He's kept His Word so that when you and I pick it up today, we don't have to worry about a mistranslation. We don't have to worry about, is it really true? Have they added something shouldn't be there? This is the very Word of God. That's what Baptists believe. B. A. We believe in the assembly. We believe in the assembly. As Hebrews tells us in chapter 10 and verse 25, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. In other words, God's people ought to assemble. What, what kind of a church do they assemble, though, when they get together? Well, we believe in a, in a proper kind of a government, a theocracy. God is in charge, yes, but also a congregational rule. Whereas church members, each church member seeks God's will. When we come for a church vote on certain issues, we come and we say, what is the will of the church? Now, we're not saying, what do you think and what do you think? Because it doesn't matter what you think. And it doesn't matter what I think. We come and we say, Lord, what do you think individually? And as we discern God's will as individuals, we vote not our mind, but God's mind in, in the desire and the understanding that all of God's people together are going to be led in the same direction if they really get in touch with God. That's the right kind of church government. There are some things we don't even vote on. We don't vote on, for instance, does the Bible say that it's by faith alone through the grace of God that you and I are saved? We don't vote on that. God's Word's too plain about that. We don't need to vote on that. Does the Bible, do, we, do we believe as a church that once a person's saved, they're always saved? Yeah, we believe that, but we're not going to vote on it. There'll never be a vote on that in this church, at least as long as I'm the pastor, because the day we start voting on it, we're voting on whether or not we believe the Word of God. The Word of God's already plain. There are things in this Bible that are so plain, there's no voting on it. There are other issues. What color the carpet? What color the pews? What kind of lights? Or what color the walls? Or whatever else that you may want to vote on. But friend, those are not Bible issues. Those are personal choice issues that a congregation has to settle. So we believe in a, in a, in a government uh, of God through the people as they seek God's leadership. We believe also in this assembly that our government should be such that we do not delegate our authority to any outside organization. The government has no business walking in here and saying, this is what you'll preach from this pulpit. I've said before, I'll say it again. This spot up here is, is mine, if you will. Now, it's not mine to do with as I wish. It's mine to do with as God wishes. From this place right up here, you draw a line and just kind of draw that line imaginary all the way around. That's my spot. It's my spot I am in charge of, I am responsible for as a man of God. I am to preach the Word and teach the Word, not my ideas or my desires, but God's desires, and I must be faithful to Him. The day the government walks in here and says, you can't preach on that, you can't talk on that, will be the day that I'll have to face whatever music comes. If I have to go to jail, I'll go to jail, so be it. I hope that day doesn't come in my lifetime, but if it happens, this pulpit will not go silent as long as I'm allowed to stand here. It will not go silent on Bible truth. We will stand for truth. No outside government is going to come in and tell us what to do in this church unless they also haul us away when we don't obey them because we're going to obey the Word of God. But let me say this also. Neither do we join any denominational group. No group that will then control this church and tell us what to do. I know of churches. I, I say churches. Uh, church organization type places that most folk would call a church. And they are told who their pastor will be from the outside. 
Literally, uh, there are times when, when the person just shows up on the doorstep. They drive in on the U-Haul and unload the new parsonage, and, and there they are, and the people see them on Sunday, and they say, we don't like this guy. It doesn't matter. Or in some cases, we don't like this gal. It doesn't matter. The denomination sent them. They're there for the duration. You can like it or you can lump it. But friend, that's not what God teaches. We don't belong to any organization. We don't belong to any convention. We don't belong to any association. We don't belong to any fellowship. There is no outside organization that comes in to tell us how to do our business. We will stay and are staying an independent Baptist church to follow the direction of God. Now, that applies to our missions work. I had a former church member write me this week. He said, Pastor Hammond, I'd like to ask you to send us some money. That got my attention. He said, I know that you've done some wonderful things in the past as a church, and, you know, I was there when we've done some of those things, and, and I knew that you'd want to know about this and pray for us at least, but send us some money if you could. So I was intrigued. I read on. He said, our, our pastor is a missionary under a mission board. He has been sent to us. We have about 15 to 20 families in our church. And we have, he sent me in the email some pictures of, of a kind of like a Quonset hut metal type building that they're meeting in. He said it's very cold here in the winter and the wind runs through here and we want to try to fix this building up so it's more presentable. And I thought, well, that's nice. He said, our pastor gets his support from the mission board. We found a, a mission organization that will send some workers in to do the work on the building. All we have to do is raise $35,000 to pay for the repairs, the materials that they're going to put into our building. They'll come and do all the work for us. We just need the money, and we're asking you to help provide some of that money. Well, I wrote him back. I said, Dear brother, I said, You may or may not remember that while you were a member here, we don't get involved with mission boards. I said, Because we don't believe that mission boards should control the church, nor do we believe that those mission boards uh, should continue supporting a pastor when the church is well able to take care of their own pastor. I said, it seems to me that a church with 15 to 20 members could pay its own bills. Seems to me that a church of 15 to 20 members ought to be, and I know that there are extenuating circumstances as well, they probably do have, but uh, I said, you know, they really ought to be able to pay their pastor. Ten tithing members is an equal salary. You take ten tithing members who give 10% of their income, that's equal to what the average uh, offering, that average Giving would be the average salary that a pastor would then receive. Then you need a few more families to help pay the bills around the church for the roof or whatever else you're going to do. I understand that, but 15 to 20 families surely could pay a pastor. And so I wrote him back and I said, I don't understand why you can't raise $35,000 if you're not paying your pastor. Number two, I don't understand why you are asking another group to come in and do all the work if you've got 15 to 25 or 15 to 20 able-bodied men in the church. Why don't they do the work in the church? And I understand that there's a place for some expertise, but I said, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. He wrote me back. He said, you just don't understand how, how hard it is here and how necessary mission boards are at times. Well, I wrote him back again. I haven't heard from him since. Now, I mean no disrespect, and I wish him the very best. But, friend, I believe that there's a place where a church needs to take on its own responsibility. We've started churches, and we've done some wonderful things for some of the churches that we've started, and I don't mind helping folks as long as those folks are willing to help themselves and work at it. But if they expect me or our church to come in and rescue them and just do for them, and they're going to sit back on easy street and let us do all the work and all the, all the paying, I'm sorry, they got the wrong fella to try to tag for that kind of a bill. I'm not going to be involved in that because I don't believe that's God's way. We believe that a mission board has no business telling a missionary how to operate. We believe that responsibility is the Lord's church's job. And the members that go out of this church as missionaries on the foreign field answer to this church. We are responsible to oversee their ministry. We are responsible if there's a need in their ministry to make sure that it gets met. We are responsible to pray for them. We are responsible to oversee those needs. We have a responsibility. And yes, it's costly. And certainly there are times when as a pastor, I wish I could just say, go see a mission board. Yeah, get that trouble off my desk. I don't want it. But also, if I did that, I'd also be saying, take all the blessings away too. I'd much rather enjoy the blessings 
as well as the burdens and do it God's way. Bible, assembly, P, stands for perseverance of the saints. The book of Romans chapter 2, it says over there, it's by continuance continuance in well, patient continuance in well-doing that we show that we have eternal life. We believe that when a person gets saved, they keep on living the Christian life. That if you get saved and then for years after you don't show any sign of life, that you never really got saved to start with. There will be a perseverance. When the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, there will be a change in your life. You won't go out and sow your wild oats for the next 20 years and then one day come back to God and say, well, I've been a Christian all along. No, sir, I'm sorry. That's not the salvation of the Bible. Then there's the preservation of the saints. We believe that when people get saved, they're preserved by God. They're kept by God. You get saved. No, you're not perfect, but thank God He's the one that does the keeping. You don't keep yourself. He keeps you. You can't be plucked out of the Father's hand. You are safe in His hands. Baptist, Bible, assembly, perseverance or preservation, and then T is two ordinances. We believe there are two ordinances to the church. Only two, not three. Two ordinances. Baptism, which you saw tonight. Baptism, what a wonderful picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is meant for saved people. Baptism is meant to be by immersion going under the water. It's not, not just a few drops of water on the head. Baptism is an immersion, a dipping, a plunging. That's what the word means. Baptism is given for a reason. It's to show the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as they go under and come back up, but also to show their own death, burial, and resurrection that they want to live a new life for the Lord Jesus. Fourth of all, that baptism is done on the authority of the Lord's church. They must have a proper authority. It's not my authority. It's not Brother Wilhite's authority. It's not some individual authority. It's the Lord's church's authority. It's the church that authorizes the baptism. Second, there's the Lord's Supper, which we will be celebrating, Lord willing, just before Easter, that week before Easter on a Wednesday night. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we understand that that is a picture of, of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus that was broken and shed for our sins. It's a picture that's given to the Lord's church. It's for the church members of that particular congregation to be reminded of what Christ has done for them and also what they now owe Christ in their life. They owe Him their all. Two ordinances. I, individual responsibility. Baptists believe in individual responsibility. That you don't just come to church and say, well, the preacher said it, i got to believe it. No, sir. Like the Bereans, you need to search it out the Scriptures and see whether or not it's so. You need to check it out for yourself because one day you'll stand before God and God won't say to you, Mark Hutchin, what did your preacher believe about salvation? Oh, he thought you'd get here by baptism? Come on in, don't worry about it. God's not going to ask such a question. God's going to say, what did you do with my son? What did you do with my, my son that I sent to die for your sins? What did you do with the truth that I gave you? And as he begins to give the five crowns out, my friend, those five crowns will be handed out in accordance with the Word of God. Did you strive lawfully? And if you did not strive lawfully, you will have those crowns removed. So you better check the book out for yourself. Yes, God gave you a pastor for a reason. But friend, I am not God and I am not perfect, as you well know by now. But you must check this book out for yourself. Study it. Individual responsibility also means we believe in religious liberty as Baptists. As I've said uh, through this flap that went on down there with Bob Jones, I don't agree with Bob Jones on a lot of things. I'm not a fan of Bob Jones. You folks know that. But let me tell you this, I will fight for Bob Jones' right to exist just like I would fight for the Catholic Church in Emmaus to exist. The government began to go down and march against them. I'd be out there picketing the government and fighting for them just as much as I would for Bob Jones. And very simple reason. Not that I agree with the Catholic Church or agree with Bob Jones. I don't have to do that. I believe in religious liberty. And I know that if they start shutting down the Catholic Church, they're going to come shut down the Baptist Church. Only it's probably going to happen the other way in order first, isn't it? If they go to shut down the Jehovah Witnesses, they're going to come and shut us down. Friend, we just believe as Baptists that if, if we lay true, truth out on the table and let others lay their error out on the table, any sane man looking at the Scriptures can judge for themselves and see what God has to say, and the truth will make itself apparent to a man with an honest heart. And so as Baptists, we don't pull a gun out and convert a man at gunpoint. We don't believe in pulling a sword out. and We don't need an unfair advantage. All we ask for is an open debate of truth. 
You let truth be laid out, and it will win in an honest, uh, seeking heart. So, Bible, assembly, perseverance and preservation, two ordinances, individual responsibility, and then S, we believe in salvation. Salvation. We believe that it changes a man. We believe it changes a woman. We believe that salvation comes through repentance, a willingness to turn from your sin and putting faith in Christ and Christ alone. Salvation is not in a church. That is not in an ordinance. It's not in a ritual. It's in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that totally transforms that, uh, that individual's life. S, salvation, and S, separation at the same time, if I may. Separation, personal separation, that God intends for His people to live a holy life. That we not be like the world, smell like the world, act like the world, talk like the world. We need to be careful of our words. We need to be careful of our thoughts. We need to be careful of our actions. We need to be careful of our dress. We need to be careful of our conduct. We need to be careful of where we find ourselves. We need to be separate as a people. But not only personal separation, there's what we call ecclesiastical separation. That as a church, we don't associate with certain organizations and groups even though they may be doing much good because of other areas that then would be compromised. As the Lord's church, the only organization we belong cooperating with are other churches that are the Lord's church and meet His designation as a church. Last of all, Bible, assembly, perseverance and preservation, two ordinances, individual responsibility, 